Hi, it's Dennis Daly. When I was working in radio in the 60s in Indiana, our station carried ABC programming. And one summer, it aired 13 episodes of a program called The Eagle and the Bear, A History of the Cold War. Sadly, I can only find episode one, but it's narrated by the great Fred Foy. Listen to this. Classic radio from the 1960s. Russia was waging war upon the West. A cold war. A war of nerves. As spring came in the year of 1948, there would be a test of the nerves of the West. Winston Churchill, always a man of words, ever the man of history, called on the West to gird itself for the long struggle. The situation has been well described by distinguished Americans as the Cold War. And the question is asked, are we winning the Cold War? We, we seek nothing from Russia but goodwill and fair play. If, however, there is to be a war of nerves, let us make sure that our nerves are strong. Strong nerves would be needed and would be put to the test in the city of Berlin. Berlin, the capital of a Germany crushed by the Allied powers of World War II. In 1948, a divided city. Berlin, split into four zones of military occupation. French, British, American, and Russian. A divided city within a divided country. Berlin, more than 100 miles behind the Iron Curtain. The story of post-war Berlin was one of crisis. In the final days of Hitler, the Russians seized the city. In July, the British and Americans took possession of their zones of occupation and with Russia set up the Allied command for the city. But late in 1945, it was clear that Russia had her own plans for Berlin. In October, Russian was made a mandatory language for study in East Berlin schools. In February 1946, communists took over a free German youth meeting in Berlin. August, a communist government was set up in the Eastern Zone. Berlin was to be made over in Moscow's image. October 1946. Elections for the Berlin Municipal Council. The communists win only 26 of 130 seats on the council. June 1947. The Berlin Municipal Council elects Professor Ernst Reuter as mayor of Berlin. Russia vetoes Reuter's election. Clearly, if Russia cannot have her way, she won't play the game. November 1947. The Big Four meet in London to discuss German reunification. To the London conference goes Secretary of State George C. Marshall. Marshall, whose name has been given to the European recovery program for the rebuilding of a shattered Europe. Marshall, architect of the military victories of the Second World War, hopes for an end to the division of Germany. Marshall's hopes are dashed by the stony-faced opposition of Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov. Marshall returns to America and reports to the nation. We cannot look forward to a unified Germany at this time. We must do the best we can in the area where our influence can be felt. All uh, must recognize that the difficulties to be overcome are immense. The problems concerned with the treaty settlements for Italy and the satellite countries were simple by comparison, since none of those countries were divided into zones of occupation, and all of them had existing form of government. At the beginning of 1948, Russia was showing her hand in Germany. New restrictions are imposed on automobile traffic between Berlin and the east zone of Germany. In February, the Russians order a 20% cut in the number of travel permits issued for cargo trucks between Berlin and the western half of Germany. The writing is on the wall. March 20th, Soviet Marshal Sokolovsky walks out of the Allied Control Council. The 29th of March, 
Russia announces that permits will be required for Allied troop movements from the West into Berlin. Russia tells the Western powers that they have no right of free access to Berlin. But Harry S. Truman has other ideas about Western rights. Truman talks of American aims. We seek no territorial expansion or selfish advantage. We have no plans for aggression against any other state, large or small. We have no objective which need clash with the peaceful aims of any other nation. The United States has been conscientious and consistent in its devotion to these principles. We have sought to assist three nations in creating economic conditions under which free institutions can survive and flourish. We have sought through the United Nations the development of a world order in which each nation feels secure under law and can make its contribution to world civilization in accordance with its own means and national tradition. We have sought to help free nations protect themselves against aggression. We know that peace through weakness has proved to be a dangerous illusion. June 23rd, 1948. The gathering crisis over Berlin comes to a head. Because of technical difficulties, the Russians cut off all passenger and freight traffic to Berlin. By the 1st of July, all highway, rail, and river traffic into and out of Berlin was cut off. The gates to Berlin swung shut. Berlin, a city of more than two million people, was completely cut off from the Western world. Or was it? While the Soviets cut off the land and water routes to Berlin, Allied aircraft were still flying through the air corridors from the west to Berlin's Tempelhof Airport. While the gates were shut by the Russian bear on the ground, the Eagles were still flying. But no one knew whether the Russians would try to interfere with the flights. It became a major crisis, a face-to-face -face confrontation between Eagle and Bear. In Washington, the lights burned late at the White House. Harry S. Truman faced the post-war's gravest crisis. There were some, including General Lucius Clay, the American commander in Berlin, who urged Truman to send an armored train into Berlin. It would be a calculated risk. It might work. Or it might set off the Third World War. If war came, Berlin would be lost, and probably all of Europe. West Berlin would have to be saved. But there had to be another way. Truman decides that the freedom of Berlin may depend upon the wings of eagles. Thirteen thousand tons of food and fuel. That was what West Berliners needed. On hand in the middle of June was enough food for 36 days. Enough fuel for 45 days. Roger, Big 845, I have your clearance. Standard clearance of Temple Off Range Station, 5,000 feet. Clearance for rolling takeoff, service wind calm, over. In the Old Testament, it is written, They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. But 13,000 tons of supplies a day? Surely that was impossible. All the world looked with dismay at the challenge thrown down by the Russian bear a city of two million people at the mercy of a Soviet blockade. The world called the American response to the Russian challenge the Berlin Airlift. The pilots who flew that airlift called it Operation Vittles. Uh, Roger, uh, 410, are you uh, nearing off and now? Uh, Roger, we're nearing off and about now, 410. Roger, I have an aircraft in sight, one seven miles north northeast of the correction. Your position is one four miles north northeast of the field. The latest Rhine main weather, one thousand overcast visibility, one and one half miles. With a haze, altimeter three zero zero four over. Roger, three zero zero. We'll call you. From Frankfurt in the American zone of western Germany to Tempelhof Airfield in West Berlin, 
260 miles. Controller, a 45 second period. No communication is received. Pull up and comply with the emergency procedure. Over. All right, here, fall one. Uh, Roger, you're clear to descend to 2,000 feet. Take up a heading of 250 QSY Channel H House. Stand by for final control over. Roger, Channel H House. Over. Your final control. Can you hear me, please? Over. All right, Roger. Roger. You need not acknowledge any further transmissions for the remainder of the run. You raise now 10 miles from touchdown. 250 degrees, you're heading. Now steer left to new heading. 240 degrees. Twin engine planes. C-47s. Food and fuel bundled into army duffel bags. Loaded on the C-47s. Lifted into the skies on wings of eagles. 260 miles to Templehof. 0 degrees, you're heading. Now nine and five eighths miles from touchdown, directing over slowly to runway center line. You're looking good. Suggest you make your final flap setting prior to reaching our glide path. Two four zero degrees, your heading is correcting you. Too slowly, steer for the left, the new heading. Two three zero degrees. Two three zero degrees, your new heading. Now you're correcting over very nicely. Your range eight and five eighths miles from touchdown. Two three zero degrees, your heading as you're coming over very, very nicely. Approaching our glide path from below, you should have your aircraft slow, slow down to final approach speed now. 230 degrees, you're heading. Now stay right to heading. Two, three, At first, three, three, only the most two, three, vital three, supplies. A handful of planes. Coming in more slowly now, you're looking good. Stay further right to 240. 240 degrees, you're heading. Your range now 7 and 1 half miles from touchdown. Coming up to our glide path from below and heading 240 degrees. Zero degrees. There you're correcting in nicely. Now steer for the right to 245. 245 degrees, your new heading. Lining up with runway course line very nicely. 245 degrees, your heading. Looking good. Steer for the right to 248. 248 degrees, your new heading. Looking very, very good. The range now six and three quarters. Mid July 1948. Operation Vittles is carrying more than 2,000 tons per day into Berlin. The absolute minimum for Berliners was 4,500 tons. 52 C-54s and 8 C-47s. Two round trips per day. 250 landings a day at Tempelhof. Not nearly enough. The decision is made to add more planes and to build a second airfield in West Berlin. The airlift would continue. Five and one half miles from touchdown. You're 110 feet below the glide path. Descending at 500 feet per minute. Coming up slowly to 80 feet below the glide path now. Two four six degrees. You're heading suspended. You just a little to the left. Steer right into the heading. Two five zero degrees. Two five zero degrees. You're into the heading. You're holding steady. 65 feet below the glide path. Coming up very slowly now to 40 feet below. Now 30 feet below the glide path, 250, you're heading. The airlift answered Russia's threat to Berlin. America was there to stay. It had been a long shot, a gamble, a daring answer to Joseph Stalin's arrogance. Now in the United Nations and in Moscow, things were happening. The gates to Berlin swung open again. Berliners proclaimed, hooray, we are still alive. May 12th, the first supply trucks in 11 months rolled down the Autobahn to Berlin. The blockade was lifted, over. In 11 months, Operation Vittles had flown 2,343,315 tons of food and coal into West Berlin. The airlift had saved more than 2 million people from starvation. But more important, it had preserved the freedom of a proud, determined, and heroic city. And Winston Churchill says, there is no doubt that the steadfastness of Berlin and the West has won a great victory. But our difficulties are not ended yet. The 
the West, the American Eagle had met and won a severe test in the Cold War War of Nerves. But the challenge of the Russian bear in the blockading of Berlin had been an open, arrogant, warlike threat. But it was open and above board. Not all of the tensions and fears of the Cold War were so simple. The ramparts of freedom were under attack not only on the front lines at the edge of the Iron Curtain. There was another threat, another menace. In front of the Iron Curtain, which lies across Europe, are other causes for anxiety. In a great number of countries, far from the Russian frontiers, and throughout the world, communist fifth columns are established and work in complete unity and absolute obedience to the directions they receive from the communist center. These are somber facts for anyone to have to recite on the morrow of a victory gained by so much splendid comradeship in arms and in the cause of freedom and democracy. But we should be most unwise not to face them squarely while time remains. That communist fifth column that threat of communist subversion, that red menace, was to reach deep into the heart of America in yet another chapter of the struggle between the eagle and the bear. You have heard episode four, Eagles in the Corridor, another program of the eagle and the bear, a radio chronicle of the Cold War presentation of the Radio News Department of the American Broadcasting Company. Created, written, and produced by H. Paul Jeffers. Directed by Dennis J. Dennehy. Audio engineering by Neil Pulse, Marty Polia, Peter Sarantopoulos, and John Snell. Special effects by Bernard Fambro. The Eagle and the Bear is narrated by Fred Ford. This is Bill Brophy inviting you to hear The Red Menace, the fifth program of The Eagle and the Bear. Go with Paul Harvey to the heart of the news. Weekdays on the ABC Radio Network. Fred Ford and the Eagle and the Bear, a classic documentary series on ABC. I'm Dennis Daly.